Your faithfulness walk beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness. All Today we are going to be at the later time for our message talking about goodness, and I don't know how we could talk about goodness without doing this first, so let's just give this a try. God is good. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. All right. We have some announcements to bring to your attention this morning. First of all, we want to give you an update with what's happening with our Constitution Committee. Our deacons have met this past week, and we've opened up the box of all of the names that have been submitted, and there was quite a few names in there, so we're going to go ahead and hold on submitting names because right now the deacons are calling through those names, and we're looking to really finalize five people who would be nominees for the Constitution Committee. So when we have those five people lined up, you as a congregation will be voting on them to actually become the Constitution Committee. So we will keep you apprised of that as we move forward. Secondly, we want you to, to be ready for, it's time, the Fall Festival. How many of you are excited for the Fall Festival? All right, that is coming up. It is going to be November 9th, 10 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 
And we're hoping this year it's going to be even bigger. So I didn't get to see what it was like last year, but I heard lots and lots of really great things about it. So I'm super excited. And so um, we're going to be starting some signups for booths soon. So be uh, listening for when those signups begin. If you'd like to participate in helping to run some of the things of the fall festival. But right now we want to start asking for donations. So please bring in candy. Pr please bring in bottled sodas. We're going to need these things for the fall festival, and they can be dropped off in Perry's office if you don't know where that is. If you turn around, there's a window there with, it looks like some bars there. He lives in the prison, I guess. But you can drop those off in his office. We want to update uh, something that's happening in our community. This is for seniors of our church. You are invited to a seminar. So this is being given in our community for how you can protect yourself from online scams. So this seminar will be held Thursday, September 26th. It's going to be in the old cafeteria of the City Hall at 9 o'clock in the morning. The presentation will be given by Officer Gary Gallup, and refreshments will also be served. Donna, you have some announcements for us this morning. Can I invite you to come share some of those? This is a journey of the shoebox. We first pack the shoeboxes. My favorite part is trying to pick out the different items to put in the box. We write our own message, just pray and think about what do we want this kid to be receiving right now. When we're done with all the shoeboxes, we gather them together and then pray over them. After we pray over the shoeboxes, we drop them off at a church that collects them and makes sure that they get to a processing center. After they take them to the warehouse, volunteers will take them and go through them to make sure that they're safe and okay. We got a full box on 15! And then they ship them on planes and boats. And trucks, canoes, donkeys, it's really cool. Once they're sent out to communities, to churches, and then those are then distributed to kids of all ages. Before they get the shoebox, someone tells them about Jesus, the greatest gift. They hear the gospel and pray together. Then they get their shoebox gift. Three, two, one! After the kids receive shoeboxes, they're invited to be discipled and learn more about Christ and his message. The main goal is to spread the word. To learn about God and that they know that God loves them. Packing the shoebox, it makes me happy, and I hope that it makes the other kids happy that are getting them. And they are able to experience Jesus' love. to package up a box, feel free to grab one or come see Brenda Coleman, Robin Mercer, or myself. Um, shoebox season has arrived. In your bulletin today, you received a little flyer about lunch next week. We're going to serve you some lunch. Um, we are looking for donations, and that donation money will go towards our shipping. Shipping, as you know, is $10 a box. But compared to $40, $50, $60, dollars, if you wanted to send one little box to Africa, it would be costing you $60. Bucks. So $10 is a bargain. Um, it goes through the processing center. It takes care of logistics. It takes care of everything. So our fundraiser next week is to help with our shipping costs for our boxes. And you can read on there, last year we sent 351 boxes. Those are 351 families that received the gospel opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. So we hope you join us. We're going to feed you well. Um, we're going to have some good desserts and stuff. On the back of that page, somebody asked me, like, what should I put in a box? On the back of that is a list of the things that can go inside a box um, for three different age groups separated by boys and girls. So this is a good piece of paper. Um, our OCC store will be open. If you want to come and build a box here and shop, we, we can help you out with that. We have wow gifts. We have odds and ends. 
um, toiletries, the things that can go in our boxes. Um, just a reminder that on Homecoming Sunday, which is November 3rd, I think I read in the bulletin, um, we'll, we'll take our family picture. We send a picture of all of us in each of our boxes that the church packs. Um, we can use help with personalized letters. We'd like to send a letter to that child. Dear friend, you know, we are praying for you and Jesus loves you. And it can be anything and anybody can help write those and we can make sure they go in our boxes. If you're interested, come see me. Um, processing center field trip. You saw the processing center. Six of us have been to the processing center um, in Charlotte and in Boone and it's an amazing time. I'm thinking that we're gonna go December the 11th through the 14th this year. It's a Wednesday through a Saturday. If you are interested in this gigantic fun-filled field trip to go to the processing center and work, come see me because I'll need to make reservations starting early October. Um, so our goal for 2024 <laughs> Um, OCC is wanting to send 10.6 million boxes to over 100 countries, and Waldo First Baptist can be a part of that. And so I just urge all of you to, to pray about it. If you want to shop, you can. If you want to come here and pack, um, any way you can serve. But most importantly, just pray about these boxes and the opportunities we have to be a part of sending God's word out to the world. And last but not least, but on Wednesday, October 2nd, for our Wednesday night service, and I believe we'll be in the sanctuary, our area coordinator for Putnam and Alachua County, her name is Anita Bradley. She actually got to go on a vision trip this summer to Peru. She went and distributed boxes. And she's going to be with us on that Wednesday night and she's going to share and show us what she did and what she saw in that trip to Peru. And I'm just telling you what, guys, it was amazing. A few of us got to see the presentation last month. And Anita is going to come and share what it's like to actually see a child receive the box that we sent. So anyway, just ask that you pray for Operation Christmas Child. And as you see things around the house, just know that we're busy taking care of it. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. What part did you need? Location, time? Thursday, September 26th. The cafeteria in City Hall, the old cafeteria, 9 o'clock. And that is uh, for online scams, how you can protect yourself from that. So you're welcome, absolutely. Operation Christmas Child, that is one of my favorite ministries just ever. So let's truly be praying about that, each and every one of us individually, how we can be part of that great ministry. Make sure you're here that Wednesday night. So it's not this Wednesday, but two Wednesdays from now. It's going to be a great time. I can't wait to hear that presentation couple more things real quick. First of all, we want you to know our AC unit, our air conditioning unit, it's still working. So this is a good thing. So we are ready to start doing some moving. Tonight, our evening worship service will be over in the sanctuary. This Wednesday night, our adult class will be meeting over in the sanctuary. We will be moving our Sunday morning worship service over to the sanctuary. Just going to wait a couple of, and there's some reasons for this. We're going to have our first Sunday morning back there, October 13th. October 13th. So about three Sundays away, I think that is. If you are new here with us this morning, we are so glad that you're here. You are our guest. We hope you're already having a great time with us. We're going to have a time of greeting right now. So if you are a member of our church or a regular attender, we would ask you to please stand. If you are new here with us, we want to ask if you can remain seated. Our ushers will come around. They would like to find you and give you an information packet. In that information packet, you will find a visitor's card. We encourage you to fit, fill that visitor card out and to place it in the offering plate as they're passed around later in the service. And at this time, we are going to enjoy a time of welcome and a song together.
great time of greeting. We are going to turn our attention now to a time of prayer. So, Brother Kenny, I see him coming there around the side. Brother, Brother Kenny is going to lead us in prayer this morning. He's fast. I told him, I said, Southern Baptists can't mingle for, for a minute. They're going to take a few minutes. But I tell you, as our first song said, just looking throughout here, the evidence is here for all of you that came out today to worship. This is, this is amazing, and it's just a blessing to see, it, it just to see how it's filled up. But let's go to the Lord and worship. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the blessings that you provided, the blessings that you've given us. Lord, that we have a place to worship. So many has come out, Lord, just to lift up your name, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, as we go throughout the service that we do and say things that are pleasing to you, pray for Pastor Joel that you give him the words to speak, Lord, that we would be understanding. And Lord, as our Sunday school last lesson had said, Lord, let us practice, Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, that we would carry it out this week, Lord, and be examples that you would have us to be. For all these things, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Here's salvation Purchase of God Washed in His Spirit Washed in His blood this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Visions of rapture now burst from my side. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Sing my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at my Savior and happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with His goodness lost in His love this is my story this is my song Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for so many blessings that you've given us, Lord. And as we give back to you just a little bit of portion of what you have given us, we ask that you will bless it. Bless those that give today. Take the money and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. All these things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one.
beautiful singing and an amazing God. Amen? Amen. Just a reminder, as we gather for worship this evening, don't forget, uh, we are going to introduce a time of testimony. So if you are coming this evening, just want you to be praying about if God has been doing anything in your life that you would like to share uh, with others. Uh, again, just maybe a couple moments. And it's just a way that we as brothers and sisters in Christ can encourage each other what God is doing in our lives. Well, we have been living in Florida now for a little over two months, and um, I was able to catch my first Florida bug. I caught it, and no, it was not a flying cockroach. It was the viral kind of bug. So uh, I've been a little sick uh, this past week. I am not 100% today, but whatever percentage I do have, I'm going to give you every bit of that percentage that I can give you this morning. If you have your Bible, I want to ask if you could please open to Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 is where we're going to start. There was a young boy who was also looking through a Bible. It was actually his family's Bible, a very special Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those kinds of Bibles before. A very big Bible. It's very old family Bible passed down for generations and this young boy was looking through this Bible with great fascination. As he was flipping through the pages, an object that was stuck between two of the sheets fell out and onto the floor. The boy looked down and he picked up that object and he examined it. And it was actually an old, large leaf from a tree. And the boy exclaimed with excitement. He said, Mom, Dad, look what I just found. And his mother replied, well, what do you have there, dear? And the boy says, Mom, I was actually just reading about this in the book of Genesis. I think I just pa found part of Adam's shirt. <laughs> if you've ever read the story of creation in Genesis chapters 1 to 3, you will see there's a lot of things that we can learn about what's good and about what's bad. Some of the things in Genesis 1 to 3 that are good, well, we know God is good. His characters and his action are good. Creation was good. At least at first, God even said it was good. And when he created man and woman, he said it was very good. The relationship that humans had with God at first was good. And even after the fall and sin would enter into the world, God would give a message of redemption that somehow this world would be redeemed back to him, and that message comes. We call it the first gospel, the Protevangelium. It's Genesis 3.15, the message of how somebody is going to crush the head of the serpent. That message is good. Of course, Genesis chapter 1 to 3, this is where marriage is first introduced. Marriage is good. The order of how God created things in our world, all of the systems, the order of our world is good. The work that God had given us to do to rule over the world and to work the land, that was good. But we also see a lot of bad that took place in that story of creation as well. Temptation was bad. Adam and Eve's choice to disobey was bad. Sin that entered the world was was bad. The fallen state that our world went into was bad. The curse that would be given to Adam and Eve, the curse that was placed upon childbearing in the land was bad. Although we were given a job to rule, humanity failed at that. That was bad. With sin now in our world, now there was disorder and chaos. That was bad. And of course, being cut off in a relationship from God because of sin was bad. Most of us, we have an idea of what is good. How would you define what is good? Well, anything that God says is good is good, right? We all agree with that? If God says it's good, it's good. Anything that is in line with God's standard, that's good. Well, what's bad? Same thing, right? If God says it's bad, it's Bad, anything that's not in line with his standard is bad. So as we think about what's good and what's bad, today we are focusing on the spiritual fruit of goodness. Now again, 
These are fruits that are meant to be shared with other people. We are to bear and share these fruits. Now, how can people experience our goodness through our words and, and through our actions? How can they see our goodness? How can they hear our goodness? Well, the list of scriptures that describe how we can share our goodness with other people is endless. I mean, we could be here all day looking at scripture, but the scripture we're going to focus on this morning, I would describe this as goodness at its best. Goodness with no limits. How we can be good to all people, how we should be good to all people, even those who might be hostile toward us. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bible open, if you want to read along as I read out loud, Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Now we've seen this word enemy before in the past several weeks as we've examined some other spiritual fruits. And we see this word enemy again today as we look at the fruit of goodness. Now why does the Bible use the word enemy? enemy. I mean, that kind of doesn't make sense, right? If we follow Jesus, we really shouldn't be making enemies of anyone, right? Why would we want to make an enemy of anyone? Well, the answer to that question, the reason that there are enemies, it's not by our choice, it's by their choice. The word enemy has to do with hostility. So your enemy is anyone who is hostile toward you, but here's the thing, especially because of your decision and your desire to follow Jesus. Someone that is hostile toward you, especially because of your decision and your desire to follow Jesus. Really, there shouldn't be any other cause for us to have enemies other than their disdain for our Christian values and our lifestyle. Now here's the thing. Those whom could put themselves as your enemy might surprise you. Who could become an enemy of yours simply because of your desire to follow Jesus? Take, for example, this passage from Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 36. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, that's an interesting statement from Jesus. Then he says, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those, what does it say? Of his own household. Wow. So what is Jesus saying here? Did Jesus come into this world with the purpose of trying to wreck families? Was that his desire, is to tear families apart? And of course we know that can't be true because God is the one who created and who defined what a healthy family is supposed to be. Instead, here is the message. This is what we gain from this. If you choose to follow Jesus, you need to realize that even your own family members might turn against you because of it. That's crazy to think, but it's reality. This past week, I was reading stories, extreme examples, and, and these were people from all over the world, people in Kenya, people in Bosnia, people in Sudan, people in Nigeria. These were people who chose to accept Christ as Savior and their family literally disowned them for doing it. And the list of these countries can go on and on. Many countries were really, it's commonplace that somebody knows, if I choose to accept Christ as Savior, if I start following Jesus, I'm probably going to lose my family because of it. That is the reality in many places in our world. Now, perhaps it's not quite that extreme here in America, but I certainly do know of families who have been fractured because of Christian beliefs. 
And one huge reason our Sunday school class was actually talking about uh, this this morning is because of all the changes recently in our culture. The changes in our government. The changes in our law. A lot of these changes, especially involving what is marriage. Changes involving people's opinion of gender. To the point where it's become those who believe that you should be able to decide whatever you want. You could call marriage whatever you want. It could be between whatever people you want it to be between. Gender, you could be whatever gender you want to be or, or not human at all. You could be an animal if you want to be. You know, it's even gone to that extreme. It has gotten to the point that certain people who believe that way can, can turn on or even have hatred toward Christians simply because we believe the values of the Bible. And we see that happening right in our country. But this should give us a good understanding of what enemy actually means. Someone who can have hostility toward you, especially because of your Christian values. So the question is, how should we treat those whom have hostility toward us? Verse 28, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Again, these words should look and sound very familiar. We have seen words like this in the past several weeks. Those who are your enemy, you should pray for them. You should bless them. You should do good to them. There's some notes if you want to follow along in your bulletin. Here's how we can bear and share the spiritual fruit of goodness with all people, including those who are our enemies, number one, by praying for and blessing them. By praying for and blessing them. Now, I think we as a church, we love the idea of praying for people. This is a church that prays. This morning for Sunday school class, we shared prayer requests and we prayed. Our Wednesday night adult group, when we get together, we share prayer requests. Sometimes that prayer time can go 15, 20 minutes. We pray. We love this idea of praying for people, but here's the question. How hard could it be for you to pray for someone who is making your life miserable? Consider that question. How hard could it be for you to pray for someone who is making your life miserable? And you might say, oh, I'll pray for that person. I'll pray something really bad's going to happen to that person. You know, God's going to take that person out. And, and I would just remind you of Romans 12, 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. We saw that scripture not too long ago. It doesn't make sense if we should have this heart that if there's something bad that happens to our enemy, we should help that person, then why should we pray? that something bad would happen to that person. Even in the way that we pray for those who are quote-unquote enemies, we must have a Christ-like heart and Christ-like words. So this is our starting point. We are to pray for our enemies. We are to bless them. Now, what extreme are we talking about here? To what extreme should we bless our enemies? Look at verse 29. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now, let's be honest. This is a hard verse, I think, for some of us. You know, if someone robs me, does that mean I should just let that person, you know, just take whatever you want. You know, you, you took one thing, just, just take it all if you want. Just take everything. A am I in that way kind of promoting criminal activity? But already, I think, if, if that's where our mind is, we've already lost what Jesus wants us to focus on. Keep the main principle in mind. The main principle is to love your enemy. That is the main principle. The main principle is to do good to those who persecute you. Do good to those who hate you. And as you hear this phrase, if someone strikes you on the cheek, understand that Jesus does not have a narrow view here. 
Jesus is not only thinking about those situations when someone is, is actually beating you up or you're getting assaulted. There's a much wider view here. There's a much bigger picture. It's any kind of violence that you can find yourself in, that someone is doing to you. And so here's the bottom line. No matter what happens, if you are being persecuted, the focus shouldn't be on your persecution. Your focus should be on Christ. That's where your focus should be. As you're being persecuted, you need to keep living for Jesus. And that means doing good to all people, including those who might be persecuting you. Now, is that going to leave you vulnerable for more persecution? Maybe. Possibly. Probably. It will. But one... Have you forgotten that Jesus is there and he will take care of you through it all? Don't you realize Jesus will protect you? And two, have you ever thought of this? Who knows? Maybe that person who is persecuting you, when you choose to respond to that person with Jesus' love, and you respond to that person with goodness, could you imagine if Jesus, through your act of kindness, starts to work in that person's heart, and through what you've done, your response, Jesus leads that person to himself. Could you imagine if you choose to respond to a persecutor with goodness, bottom line, that person gets saved. Could you imagine that? That really could happen. Jesus can use our response in that way. I think, wow, that's incredible. This past week, I was reading a true story. It comes from a, a website. It's called Mission India. There was a woman who gives her testimony. She was brought up by a family, and this family worshipped many gods. They, they did not believe in the one true God. They did not believe in Jesus. This woman hated Christians. Absolutely hated them. And any time a Christian would come into her area to share the gospel, she would stop them. She would try and argue with them. She would bring her neighbors with her to literally beat them up. She absolutely hated Christians. And then there were two things that completely changed her life. The first thing that happened was her sister got sick. And so this woman and her family, they started praying to all of their gods, and they sacrificed to all of their gods, and they took her sister to the hospital, and nothing worked. But someone chose to reach out to her with kindness, with a heart of goodness, a Christian, although this person knew he was hated by her, and encouraged her, you need to bring your sister to church you need to have a pastor pray over her. And she did that. A pastor prayed over her. And that day, God started to heal her sister. She didn't forget that. Time went on, and at a later time, she got sick herself. She had these horrible situations that she was bleeding from her face, from her nose, from her mouth. Blood would just gush. And she looked at everything again. She went to the hospital. She was taking medicine. Again, she sought these false religions and their gods, and nothing helped. And once again, a Christian person reached out to her and said, do you realize only God can heal you? And in hearing those words, she took herself to a church. A pastor prayed over her. He shared the gospel with her. He gave her a Bible. And so she made the decision, she started to seek after Jesus, and would you believe it, three days later, she started to get well. And when you read this woman's testimony online, now you find out her husband is a pastor. And she and her husband are now ministering in their village and to surrounding villages her ministry is she ministers to children. She tells children about the love of Jesus Christ. This was someone who hated Christians, someone who persecuted Christians, but because they were Christians that chose to reach out to her in love and kindness and with goodness, Jesus saved her. 
That's incredible to think about. You never know what Jesus can do with your act of goodness. Don't ever forget that. Secondly, in your bulletin, we need to focus on doing good even when we're persecuted or we experience loss. Now, we focused on that first thing, the persecution being struck on the cheek. What about loss, experiencing loss? If someone takes your cloak, we shouldn't withhold our tunic. By the, by the way, a tunic is like a long gown. It would usually be over the cloak. So that cloak is the first thing they would take, and, and you, you can have my tunic as well. Well, let me ask you, how often has something like that happened to you? Can you remember a time in your life when somebody literally tried to steal clothes right off your body? Any of you? Has that ever happened to you? It hasn't happened to me. You know, how applicable is this verse to us? Well, very. Because again, Jesus doesn't have a narrow view here. It's not just about when people try and steal clothes off your body. The broader view is when you experience any kind of loss, especially as a result of hostility that people have toward you because of your faith. Let's think about the example of us as a church. What if there were people that were hostile toward us as a church that they were trying to take things away from us? What if there were people that were trying to take away from us these buildings, the places that we meet? We can no longer meet in this room, the sanctuary, no rooms. They're trying to take all of these rooms away from us. What if something were to change in our law and people tried to take this away from us? Now, I'm definitely not saying we should just roll over and let it happen. I mean, this, this is important. Where we gather together for worship, that's important. To have God's word is important. And there are things that we can do peacefully in order to try and stop that. But again, we're already off track if all we're doing is focusing on the persecution itself. What we need to remember is we have to focus on Jesus' command. Focus on loving those who persecute us. Focus on doing good to those who persecute us. And so what would we do to those who are trying to take these buildings away from us? What would we do to those who are trying to take these Bibles away from us? Here's what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't attack them. We shouldn't harm them. We shouldn't assault them. We shouldn't slander them. You might be tempted to do those things, but think of the example of Christ. Because you think about what people did to him. When he was on trial, when he was persecuted, whipped, crown of thorns placed on his head, when he was nailed to the cross and left there to die, he was persecuted. Did he respond by assaulting those people? He was good to them, even unto death. And the same is true of somebody does try and take something away from you individually. What if somebody tries to take away your clothing? What if somebody tries to steal meals right out of your refrigerator? What if somebody steals money from you? Again, the example Jesus gives here is a cloak and a tunic. tunic. And, and the question is, is it really worth us fighting to get these things back or hold on to them? Because here's the thing. When you think about a cloak or you think about a meal from your refrigerator, or you think about a couple of dollars in your wallet, let me ask you, what is that as far as it goes to an eternal value? What is the eternal value of those things? What if somebody steals away from you a box of Fryer's chicken? I knew that was going to get you riled up. Now it's a different situation, right? What is the eternal value of a box of fryer's chicken? Honestly. Maybe the person who took it needs it more than you do. They didn't go about it in the right way. Our focus is how do we respond to that person? How do we love that person? How do we do good to that person? Verse 30. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. So not just those who steal from you, but now think about those who beg of you. Think about those who ask from you. 
in your bulletin number three. We can bear, share goodness by giving to those who quote unquote beg. I'm not sure if this is the best word here because I don't know how many of us have experienced often people who walk right up to our face and, and beg us for something. That, that probably has happened sometimes, but there may be times we know somebody has a true need and they're not begging. They may not be asking at all. What can we do? What should we do? And here, I think it is so important, please, let us not underestimate. Please, let us not ignore the kind of love and care and attention that Jesus has for people who are poor, that Jesus has for people who are homeless. We cannot get away from that. It's all over the Gospels. If you look at, look at Luke 11, Matthew 25, Matthew 5, John 13, Mark 14, Luke 14. I can give you many, many more. There's so many scriptures where there's not only attention that is given to those who are poor and homeless, how you see Jesus love those who are poor and homeless, but more than that, how he commands us to love those who are poor and homeless. So let's cut to the chase. Because let's talk about the reality of the situation of where we live. Right here, we know in this area, there are many people who are poor and homeless. We know in this area, there are people who are on the streets that are asking for help. Can we do something to help? Even just in small ways. Here's an easy idea. Maybe when you go and travel, have with you in your car, we've talked about this as a family, have some little individualized snacks in your car. That if you see someone in need, you could reach right out, give that person a snack. Now it should be something that can preserve well, something that does well in heat, obviously. A chocolate bar is probably not a good idea. You don't keep that in your car. But you could just hand this out when you see someone in need. Be ready. Now, this does bring us to something I want to bring up. It's a helpful thing to think about. Let me, let me make this statement, and we're going to talk about this in detail. Something we've got to be careful of. I hope we realize the difference between these two words, helping someone and enabling someone. Do you realize the difference between those two words? Helping and enabling. We, we probably have a good idea of what helping means. You do something to help someone. It's constructive. That person gets further along in life because of it. There's good habits there. It's a very positive thing. The word enabling, here's what enabling means. If you don't know what that means, enabling means to do anything that encourages the continuation of bad behavior. So here's an example. Perhaps someone has an alcohol addiction. And this addiction is so bad that person cannot keep a job, that person can't pay for his bills, but that person comes to you and asks for money so that he could pay for his bills. And you give that person money, but then you notice over time the bills are still not being paid for, but that person still has alcohol, and that person is still drinking. Cutting to the chase, in situations like that, I can tell you it is almost always a bad idea to give money in that kind of situation. That doesn't work. So, you know, your desire is for what? You want to see that person break the addiction out of love and care for that person. That is the best thing. That person has to break out of that addiction. That person has to stand on his two feet again. That person has to get back to work and start providing. And so it's hard. I'm not going to say it's not. It's hard. When you come across these situations, it's hard to know the difference between enabling and helping we want to help that person, we do. Perhaps maybe it's giving that person hot meals instead of money. But what you're going to need to do is pray. When you have an opportunity to help someone and you're not sure, is this helping, is this enabling, you're going to need to pray for God's wisdom, maybe to talk to some other mature believers. How can you help that person? Because we do want to help without a very good potential of enabling that person. That's just something to keep in mind. Verse 31 here. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Ah, 
This should sound familiar to some of us. What, what do we call this? This is called the, this is basically the golden rule, right? Also found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Now, when I was a child, I used to watch a cartoon. It was called DuckTales. Maybe you remember DuckTales? DuckTales, there was this character. His name was Scrooge McDuck. Now, Scrooge McDuck, he was very rich, very greedy. Scrooge McDuck had lots of money. And Scrooge McDuck defined the golden rule. Here, here's what he said. He said, the golden rule goes this way. He who has all the gold makes all the rules. Now, is that true? That's not the golden rule. What is the correct meaning of the golden rule? Well, let me read to you the other place we find this. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It says, whatever you desire or want others to do to you, do also to them. Number four in your bulletin, do to others as you want them to do to you. Do to others as you want them to do to you. This is important. Now, remember, this should come with a Christ-like desire and to do things in a Christ-like way. Do to others in a Christ-like way as you want them to do to you based on a Christ-like desire, because we can really get off track in things that are not good with that. But this is helpful, and here's why. Because when you do this, it can help you understand the reality of a need if you could see things from that person's shoes. When you try and put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see it from that person's perspective, what would you want done to yourself if you were in that person's shoes? Do that to that person also. What would it be like if one day you went home and you opened up your refrigerator and there was no more food in it and you had no way of putting any more food in it? What would you want people to do to you? What would it be like if you didn't have a home to go to anymore? For whatever reason, you lost your home. What would it be like if you lost your job and you had no income and perhaps for some time would not have income? What would you hope people would do to you? What would it be like for you to experience some kind of horrible medical tragedy and the hospital bills start stacking up and the insurance won't pay it? and you're due all this money, what would you want people to do for you? Here's the truth, is it could be so hard for us to be empathetic to others, to care for other people when we're thinking about everything from our situation right now, if your life is really comfortable, if life is not so difficult, if life feels really safe. But when you could put yourself in another person's shoes and think, what would I want people to do to me if I was in that situation? That's where we can gain the heart of Christ even more. <clears throat> We're going to have to wrap this thing up because I don't know how much longer I can go. Check, one, two, there we are. All right, you still hear me? All right, so we're going we're gonna to wrap this thing up because my voice is just about done. Let's continue reading verse 32 on. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you led to those who led uh, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So here Jesus uses strong language. What good is it to do good to those who love you? Even sinners do that. What we focused on this morning is so important. True Christ-like goodness means no exclusions. That we want to be good to all people. Jesus was good to all people. And what will happen if you do that? Last point in your bulletin, God will reward you. 
God will reward you. Now, that shouldn't necessarily be the motivation for our goodness, but I can promise you it is a blessed consequence. Not every consequence is bad. There are good consequences too. This is one of them. If you are good to all people, God will reward you. And so here's how I want to close this morning. And I really want to ask you to think about this question honestly. Honestly. Here's the question. Who in your life would it be the hardest person for you to show goodness toward? Who in your life would be the hardest person for you to show goodness toward? Maybe someone who has been or is hostile toward you right now. Maybe it's someone, if you're honest, you just don't like this person. Maybe it's somebody who hurt you really badly in the past. Maybe it's someone that you still have not forgiven about something. I really want you to wrestle with that question. Who in your life would be the hardest person for you to show goodness toward? I'm going to invite the worship team up. <clears throat> this morning we focused on goodness and I want to tell you about the good, best goodness that there is. The absolute best goodness. We actually call this the good news. Here's the good news. Is that Jesus can save you. The bad news is that we were all born as sinners. The bad news is that there's a consequence for our sin. It's spending an eternity in hell. A place of eternal torment. But again, the good news is that Jesus can change all of that for you right here, right now. The good news is that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. The good news is that he paid your penalty. He was your sacrifice. The good news is that the Bible says that all you need to do to be saved and forgiven of your sin is simply to believe in him as Savior. That's the good news. And so this morning, if you'd like to make that decision, if you'd like to ask some questions about salvation, talk to me more about salvation, I invite you to come forward as this, this last song plays our time of invitation. In addition to this, the altar is always open to all of you. I come back to that question. Is there someone that you can say, I cannot be good to that person? For whatever reason, it's too difficult. Maybe this morning you need to bring that before the Lord to ask for him to do some work in your heart. Or maybe it's something else, it's anything else. Is your heart heavy this morning? Is it sad? Is it bitter? Is it hurting? Are you stressed out? Are you discouraged? Whatever is on your heart, come before the Lord this morning as our worship team.